Good day, YouTube. Warbles on a lot here. On the 21st of March. So, happy equinox. One of the questions I've been uh, asked recently is that of how long have you been prepping? How long have you been expecting the global vile age to go away? Hmm, 21 May 2016. So, boat green or die is not any sort of a, a flash in the pan sort of an idea for the kind of greenie who carries habitually a first aid kit the size of a backpack, literally, and a backpack fire extinguisher too, because truth in labelling, you know? But anyway, seven or eight weeks ago, when I saw the pair of coronavirus preppers in the Glen Innes supermarket, goggled, gloved, masked, filling their shopping trolleys with cans of soup, toilet paper, dog food, pasta, pasta sauce. I asked them, how long have you been prepping? And they said, oh, a bit over a week. So I was fairly impressed that they'd gone at it so wholeheartedly. They asked me, how long have I been prepping? kind of a difficult question to answer. What are your classes prepping? I mean the first time I was aware that atom bombs were atom bombs was maybe 1969 when I read it in Great Aircraft by Norman Macmillan, one of the foundational texts upon which I'm relying for my ongoing series on Sop with Camelology. Um, it was one of the other aeroplanes in the book it was the B-29 Super Fortress, which dropped the first atom bombs in anger. So far, the only atom bombs to be dropped in anger. And then about a year or two later, I was bringing home the Sunday paper, maybe 1971, 72. And the headline, big bold points, Nixon ready to drop N-bombs in NAM. Because he wanted to stop North Vietnam from supplying the Viet Cong and he wanted to stop the North Vietnamese army from moving south into South Vietnam. So, okay, I would have been nine or ten years old back then. Then... When I was maybe 15, off at boarding school, I'd become so institutionalised that in order to get the best bed in the dormitory, in my opinion, I literally went back to school a day early. And nobody else was there to compete, so therefore I set up my stuff in the bed that I wanted and I was pretty happy. And that meant that I had a day of wandering around the school at a loss, a loose end, poking into nooks and crannies. And I found a book written by Neville Shute, whose full name was Neville Shute Norway. The book was Requiem for a Wren. And as an aeroplane freak at age about 15, I was wildly impressed that in among all the romance stories that novelists usually go on with, everything that was written about aeroplanes, as far as I could figure it, was absolutely spot on. So it was a library book and I found it in a cupboard and even though I liked it a lot I had the idea that there was more so I took it back to the library and I found that there was the best part of a metre's worth of books all identically bound all by the same author um, there's 22 of them actually 
So I read them, and one of them was a book called On the Beach, which is a kind of a Navy saying for a sailor who's no longer able to go off to sea. They're stuck on the beach. And the particular Navy gentleman was in the Royal Australian Navy. He was stationed at Melbourne. He lived outside Melbourne. And the reason he was stuck on the beach was because the Northern Hemisphere had decided to have a thermonuclear war. And Neville Shute, by that stage, I realised that he was an aeroplane designer and he knew a few things engineering and technical-wise, and he'd come to the opinion from what he'd seen during World War I, the interwar years, World War II, the early Cold War, he'd come to the conclusion that when NATO and the Warsaw Pact and the Chinese nuked the hell out of each other, they were going to pollute the atmosphere of the Northern Hemisphere to the point where life could not, human life could not exist on the earth, probably not animal life. Um, and he figured that because the heat pressure equator moves north and south every year, the radiation would be transferred to the Southern Hemisphere and it would move southward. And therefore Melbourne was gonna be the last place to die on earth where you had an actual full on British imperial civilization. And that was the premise of the whole book. And I kind of swallowed it hook, line and sinker. And, and at the time that he wrote it, it was probably about right because back then they had ICBMs, but they weren't very accurate. So the way the military compensated for the lack of accuracy was to make the bombs bigger. As time went on and guidance systems became much more better, huh? The idea became instead of having huge bombs and landing them somewhere within five miles, ten miles of your intended target, and it didn't matter because they were such a big bomb, the idea became to make a smaller and smaller and smaller bomb with a better guidance system on its delivery mechanism and get it to go in the window of the office block that you had a problem with whatever it was they were doing. Um, so yeah, things were changing by the 1970s when I was starting to worry about it. Um, but I do remember feeling a sense of indignation in the 70s when I realised that I'd been eating plutonium on the cornflakes when I was two and a half years old when Queen Elizabeth II, her heirs and successors and duly appointed minions, decided to nuke Maralinga. They did a fizzle yield test on a plutonium bomb studying potential fratricide incidents. What happens with two aircraft drop two atom bombs, one of them goes off, the shock wave of it interrupts the firing mechanism of the second bomb and it fires crookedly. A fizzle yield test. Yeah. Yeah, um, my status as a subject of the British imperial realm meant that I was supposed to be grateful for that in the 1960s. By the 1970s, I was not actually grateful for sitting downwind of the British bomb test at Maralinga. I was pretty peeved with the whole idea. Then, probably in about 1980, I, uh, I, I, I stumbled across a book called Third World War, August 1984. And it was written by, I think it was four retired NATO generals four retired NATO air marshals and four retired NATO admirals. And they had this complicated theory which suggested that because the only way the Kremlin maintained authority in Moscow was to put the Red Army into a, a rebellious satellite state crush a rebellion every 10 or 20 years. And their theory was that by 1984, Yugoslavia would need to have its rebellion crushed when Tito died. And they, they then went straight on ahead with that. And it made so much sense to me in early 1980 that I decided, well, okay, if they blow up the bloody Northern Hemisphere, there are gonna be targets in Australia, starting with Pine Gap, Narunga, Northwest Cape, probably Darwin, Townsville, Cairns, Brisbane, Sydney, Jarvis Bay, Canberra, maybe Melbourne. 
I knew that there were no atomic targets around here because my parents had gone to civil defence lectures during the 1970 Nixon ready to drop N-bombs on NAM event. And they come home with the story that there's nothing worth anybody dropping an atom bomb on anywhere near here. We'll only have to worry about fallout if they try to bomb Brisbane or Sydney or, you know, maybe Pine Gap and they go a couple of hundred miles wrong and we finish up in an intense fallout cigar. So that was kind of reassuring as a kid. But my impression is that when a civilization falls, the people who live within the shadow of the castle, they either prosper or they die. So the idea, if you wanted to survive the fall of a civilization, was to be out there on the hairy edge so that your standard of living was not nearly as high as that right in the bright, sparkly night lights of the city. But when the city fell down, your standard of living would not be too savagely diminished. It wouldn't diminish terribly fast and you wouldn't have a horribly hard landing at the bottom of the drop sort of thing. So I figured what I needed to do was develop some kind of a skill which I could practice with my little hands and my little head so that in a post-apocalyptic society I might be considered a socially useful individual. Now in my case I went nursing. I did nursing training. I spent three years as a student nurse and I graduated with distinction and, and then I went and got a job at the Vegetable Creek Hospital at Emmerville. 25 bed hospital, village of 600 people, not on a highway, off the beaten track. I had third generation antecedents in the area so I I didn't go to the local school out there, but I was considered a local because, you know, I was part of a particular family that my grandmother was a, a part of. So, yeah, that was my strategy for surviving World War Three, the nuclear variety. And it never, ever happened. I expected it to happen. I prepared for it to happen. I didn't want it to happen. It was a case of there was three and a half billion other people who lived on the planet they had convinced themselves that their national honour required them to atom bomb people who lived in another country who they'd never ever met. They weren't interested in my opinion. So the best I could try and organise to do would be to outlive them. They were exercising their free will to trash the biosphere and smash the world and then blow up their civilization. I'd see what I could do to outlive them. Why not? The whole thing runs on free will, perfect liberty, perfect responsibility, and perfect liberty means absolute freedom to pick wrong. They picked working their ass off to pay the tax to build more atom bombs. I picked going and getting a relatively lowly paid job working in a little hospital out in a village. And yeah, eventually I acquired nurses back. And by that stage, I'd rented a house five miles out of town on one and a half thousand acres that was being grazed by somebody else who had a grazing lease and I, I had the house rent lease. And I had such a long enforced rest from being in the middle of the hubbub of society that I came to the conclusion it'd be kind of difficult to be able to make a living in any way which didn't degrade the biosphere and as frank herbert said in his dune trilogy the prime function of biology is that the more life occupies a space the more life can occupy the space because each additional species provides niches for additional species i don't know whether frank herbert ever considered ferals in an established system but yeah, he's, he's kind of right in that the more interconnecting links between different species sharing the one patch of dirt, the more resilient life is in that part of the planet. If you've, only, if you've got a desert with only one or two species, anything can change and every, everything dies. Um, so, yeah, then I moved from being a hermit to marry a woman with a couple of kids. And we lived in a village and it went on for six years and at the end of it, we had four kids. But she and I couldn't live together. So 
I came up here and I've been trying to raise my kids to be prepared in the Boy Scout sense for the fact that fossil fuel industrial civilization, the global vile age as I think of it, because of its effect on the environment, you know, it would disappear during their lifetime. And they both sort of decided at a probably a pubertal age that this was an obsession that their father suffered from, a dystopian delusion, and therefore they didn't really need to pay too much attention to it because it was just something to listen to. It was it, no harm to think about it. But we get onto the topic of how long have I been prepping on for? Look at that. That is a cylinder for containing liquid petroleum gas. Those of you who know anything at all about cylinders for liquid petroleum gas are probably aware that the ones you see these days, they have a welded sheet steel shield to prevent the valve from being accidentally knocked off and venting pure gas to the atmosphere. This is what a gas cylinder looks like in 2020. And on that sheet metal guard, it tells you that we're talking 2.9 kilograms tear weight. Uh, it complies with a 2006 standard. It was tested in January 2013. Okay, so 10 years after that, in January 2023, it will become illegal to fill that. They've been printing those manufacturing dates for a while. Now here's my stockpile of time expired gas camping stoves. They've been out in the rain. They're completely disused. I don't know why I haven't taken them to the dump. Um, the one on the top was given to me by my cousin. It was his big brother's. Belonged to my, uh, my cousin who died on a motorcycle when he was 25, riding in city traffic. It replaced this one, which I got in 1979. No, 1978 for Christmas. I'd left school. I was about to go off into the world and my parents gave me a two burner Coleman gas stove. So the original gas bottle that came with the stove when I was a kid getting it for Christmas, that's long gone. But there are some people who when they go to the dump and they see something that looks as if it might be just a little bit useful, not quite ready to throw out yet, they can't help themselves, they bring it home. So I went to the dump not so long after I got that thing and I saw at the dump an old cylinder which did not have any guard around there. But I fancy at the time, it wasn't actually out of date. So before it became impossible to fill this cylinder, I had picked it up from the dump and taken it to a filling station. As you can see, it's a while since this has been opened. But anyway, hear that? What that is, is a type 3965 TP 480 pounds PSI, water capacity 10 pounds 9 ounces, tear weight 6 pounds 15 ounces. Companion Heaters Proprietary Limited, made in Australia, AS number B115240, on the 3rd of 1970. The frickin' Vietnam War was still raging back when that thing was made. So 40 years ago, I rescued it from the dump. And then, before it became impossible to fill, I took it and I got it filled. 
So there should be almost seven pounds of gas in there if it's full, plus we have the weight of the cylinder. And what we get is 11.5 pounds. So I'm prepared to bet that what we're looking at is an absolutely jam-packed full 1970 vintage cylinder. Went out of date 40 years ago. How long have I been prepping? Why would that be? Hmm? Living with a bunch of people who don't seem to accept the fact that if there's no environmental surplus, then no economic activity is possible. Therefore, they are feeding every environmental surplus to the purpose of growing their economy. Finally, we get to the point where the ecology fights back. Humanity has become a plague. Do I want humanity to become a plague? No. Did I want humanity to become a plague? No. Did I vote for humanity to become a plague? No, I voted against it. I've been voting green for 40 years. I've been prepping for 40 years. Because by the time I was 19, it was obvious that the shit is going to hit the fan because the plan, Stan, is to grow the economy until the wheels fall off the ecology and then everybody dies. Take the case of Ebola or Hendra or now Corona. Ebola and Hendra and Corona are bat viruses. They live in the bats. The bats tolerate the virus having evolved to do so. Normally a happy, healthy bat carries all three of them perhaps and doesn't have a problem. But when the entrepreneurs from the growing population, from the growing economy go out there and they log the forest and cut down all the old fruit trees, the bats have got nowhere to go and they get stressed. And when they get stressed, because they're underfed and they're working hard looking for enough tucker to stay alive, they succumb to viruses they normally would not succumb to. Now in Australia with Hendra virus, they then go and they find an area where the real estate agent has cut the place up into five or 10 acre hobby farms, subdivisions, which had been cleared and there's one or two big trees left in each paddock as shade trees for the livestock. The racehorse fantasy, perhaps. The pony club fantasy. The goat dairy fantasy. Anyway, the last surviving bats all feeling sick, they show up at the last trees and they hang there feeling crappy all day and they crap and because that's where the animals are supposed to congregate, that's where the feed troughs are, so that's where the racehorse fantasy collects the Hendra virus. And then the people who own the racehorse, racehorse fantasy go and kiss it and cuddle it because it looks sick and it needs to have its forehead petted. And they get Hendra virus and then they die and it set the industry back a heap of money and they had to come up with a vaccine and, and all kinds of protocols and very expensive and you know, if you hadn't cut down the bloody trees, the fruit trees where the bats used to live, they'd have somewhere else to go and they'd have plenty of feed and they wouldn't be stressed and they wouldn't be shitting in your horse feed and you wouldn't be dying of Hendra virus. Ebola. Same story, only instead of putting the bloody last tree over the top of your horse trough, over there in the Republic of the Congo, your entrepreneurial types get their shotguns and their four-wheel drive utes and they go off until they find a tree with bats in it and the bats aren't stupid they have sentries as as the local yokels apply with their anti-aircraft bat gunnery the bats that are healthy enough to fly away fly away so it's only the sick bats who are still there to be shot down and put in the eskies and taken to the nearest crossroads and sold to the truckies who take them into the cities and then on sell them to the bush food restaurants and the meat markets. That's how it was going in Africa and that's how we've had all of these outbreaks of bat eaters virus. Ebola bleed the death through your eyeball virus. You know, it's kind of like the forest's last desperate gasp saying to the ever expanding human hordes, go away, leave this alone. You've already cut down enough. Keep going, and things are going to come out of the forest that'll kill you. Well, 15 or 20 years ago, 
in China, they decided that they could commercialise the wet market. Their theory was if they commercialise the wet market and allow people to keep wildlife and farm them, then it'll be a protective manoeuvre for the wildlife out there in the wild. What it did was made lots of people keep lots of different species of overcrowded, stressed wildlife together so that they could all get sick and swap viruses. And somehow, I have no idea how, I was explaining to my 83 year old mother yesterday, no, no, no mum, I don't think that any clever little asshole in a laboratory anywhere has cooked this one up because it is too fine tuned, it's too subtle. Nobody between naught and nine years old has died of the virus. One person between nine and 19 has died of the virus. 60% of everybody who's died of the virus is over 55. Every time the virus kills 33 women, it kills 66 men. This virus is literally particularly targeted at the age group who have voted to go ahead with global warming and habitat destruction and mass extinction. Irrigation and salination and erosion. My generation, the space cadets, my older siblings generation, the baby boomers, my even older siblings generation and my mother's generation, the silent generation, these are the people who've been pretty happy for the last 50 years to just let everything keep on going because the stock market always goes up. Well, I have no idea whether the virus is capable of discriminating against the people who voted to grow the economy versus the people who voted to just back off and try and protect the environment and see what the environment was capable of sustaining before making economic prescriptions. As the story goes, the Lord works in mysterious ways, so maybe it is so. I don't know. The God theory to which I subscribe has a wickedly vicious sense of humour, particularly when dealing with smart asses who seek to treat their own God theory like an idiotic infant, an imbecile. The people who say that they believe in the God theory of thou shalt not kill, and they sleep behind armed weapons, loaded guns. Just in case, you know, like for the day my God theory is not working and I need to shoot all the bad guys that are going to come and sneak up on me. Yep. It'll be interesting to see just how discriminating the virus is, but I don't believe any person has set it up. I believe it's situation normal, all fucked up. All the entrepreneurs have been out there competing for the last few bats in the last bit of forest so they could bring them to the town and sell them to the city bred yuppies. And it just happens that China's got more cashed up city bred yuppies than the rest of the world put together. And it also just about turns out that China has got this really top down authoritarian society where in at when the bureaucrats on top, when the mandarins say jump, everybody says how high after their feet leave the floor. So when China said we're going to lock down half a dozen cities of 11 million people to the person, that's what they did. In Italy, they put a ring fence around the very first town where the very first case was isolated and they tested everybody in the town. There were 3,700 uh, 3, people in the town, 87 of them tested positive and they had absolutely no symptoms, no signs, no indication that they were sick. So it turns out if you'll take Italy where there were no travel bans and they didn't do any sort of social isolation or lockdowns until everything already got out of hand, by the time you get the first case, 3.7% of your population is already infected. By the time the first case presents at hospital, 3.7% of your population is already infected. Italy's current death rate on the number of cases presented is about 8%.
at the moment, 14% of all diagnosed cases require hospital treatment. And yeah, about half of them, 7%, they require intensive care respirator therapy and half of them die if they get the treatment. In Italy, because 20% of the people who get severe cases are under 60, all their intensive care beds and all their intensive care beds with ventilators are all absolutely full of people who are under the age of 60. So anybody over 60, you can't get a hospital bed. Anybody who's got a pre-existing heart condition, pre-existing hypertension, pre-existing diabetes, or they've been treated for cancer, no hospital beds. Australia is kind of looking at tracking closer to China than we are to South Korea or Singapore or Taiwan, where they really jumped on everybody, locked everybody down. I don't know how bad it's going to be in the United States of America, the excited status of Norte Armed Americano. Um, if you look at the pre-existing comorbidity rate of somewhere where there are so many people who are what we used to call obese 30 years ago that the, the midline has shifted. So being 10 or 20 pounds overweight by the standards that I grew up with is now considered normal and that's Australia and the United States. Diabetes has been expanding at an ever increasing rate. Hypertension, how many people are on pills for hypertension? Um, there's been a lot of criticism of people who've been panic buying. Well, the only reason they're panic buying is because they didn't gradually, slowly build up a stockpile of spare uneaten food, spare unused tubes of glue, toilet paper rolls, whatever it is. They've habitually, literally lived from check to check and they don't have any ready reserves because, you know, just in time delivery of everything is so much more efficient. All of a sudden, it becomes fairly obviously clear from the media that in X number of weeks time, when the virus has started to show itself, you know, double the number of cases initially every six days and then every three days. And by the time the first case shows, you've already got 37 cases, no, 87 cases in a, a, a town of three and a half thousand. A lot of people can do the maths on that. You know, they've got a calculator, they finished high school, they can say, oh, well, in about two or three weeks, our government is going to tell us that we have to lock ourselves down and stay in our house and not go out except for vitally important things. How much of a change is that going to make with everybody else's life? A huge change. How much change does it make to my life? Well, I only go to town three times a week, you know, unless I'm making a special extra trip to cart some firewood to my mother. And if I jig the schedule, I can cart the firewood to my mother on one of the three days that I normally go there. One day a week's to do her shopping and my shopping. Twice a week's to make sure that the 83 year old hasn't fallen down on the floor and broken a leg while I was away. On the raw statistics, she hasn't got much of a chance if she gets the coronavirus. On the raw statistics, I'm probably looking at a 10 or 20% chance of turning my toes up too, because I'm 59. And my family dies of heart disease. So, you know, if I've got a pre existing heart condition, I just haven't officially noticed it yet. One of my long term viewers, possibly, probably a subscriber, for a long time they were a troll on my channel, has got a deeply held fixation to the effect that because I've seen this coming for a long time, therefore 
because I've seen it coming for a long time and because they are unable to argue me out of the fact that this was going to happen, you know, I've been saying for years, this is on the cards and I've been saying for years in terms of absolute how much human suffering, it would have been better if Reagan and Gorbachev had a nuke the world in 1984 because then the survivors would have had a much more prolific, vibrant, sustainable, reliable environment to try and rebuild civilization into. Whereas their attitude seems to be that anybody who says that we would have been better off having World War Three back then because we'd be better off now, that's wicked, evil, nasty, heartless, and, and therefore the individual concerned is, is beyond contempt. And they keep coming up in the comment thread saying that, and I've just about sort of had it up to here. You know, the particular individual claims to be a US military veteran. So, you know, like I've spent the last 40 years trying not to contribute to the problem. What did they do when they come of age? Fucking little pup they are, you know, like 20 years younger than me or something. Oh, they went and held their fucking hand out to go and blow the bloody world up because of weapons of mass distraction that weren't in Iraq anyway. And they claim that I'm a mass murdering killer megalomaniac. Yeah. I guess it comes down to the Jesus theory. Forgive them, they know not what they do. They're too fucking stupid to realise the difference between shit and shoe polish. That's why their boot leather rots away so often, so regularly. So yeah, um, am I happy that it looks like, well, tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of people are gonna die from a sudden acute respiratory syndrome from the novel coronavirus. I'm not happy about it. I can't prevent it. I could see that it was a likelihood. All of the epidemiologists have been predicting this for at least 40 years. You know, like in 1980, I was a student nurse. I, I sat lectures in epidemiology. I've passed exams in it and barrier nursing as well. And when you haven't got all this Yahoo yippee high technology, which is rationed because, you know, $15,000 a day for a bed in an intensive care unit, it all comes back to pre-Edwardian Victorian era quarantine, isolation and barrier nursing techniques. It's a new virus, but there's nothing going to be new about how it's dealt with. Holland and England initially started talking about, oh, we're going to rely on herd immunity. And I kept on saying that until somebody who had a few learnings in medicine pointed out to them that if you rely on herd immunity, it means you're going to wait until 60% of the people in your population have recovered from the disease and therefore they can't get it again. So that'll stop the disease from spreading. But it means that out of the people who catch the disease, you might have 8 to 15% mortality rate. All of a sudden, England's not going to rely on herd immunity anymore. They're going to tell everybody to lock themselves up. And what have we learned from the lockup? We've learned that just as, you know, the loudmouth greenie living on the hill, hugging the trees, feeding the kangaroos and chasing the sheep, just as I've been saying for years, if we were serious about global warming, we'd have to get rid of sport organized sport because of the carbon emissions involved in traveling to look at the feet ball or the cricket or the bastard ball or whatever the bloody sporting event is people spend their whole lives flying all over the world looking at it other people spend their whole lives training up to compete in it so that they can spend the other half of their lives hopping and limping and being a cost on the orthopedic surgical community because they've buggered all of their joints trying to be a half of a poofdillionth of a second faster or go a little bee's dick higher. All of a sudden, no, we've got an actual problem in the world. So oh, that's it, sport's cancelled, fashion's cancelled, going out and partying and getting pissed, that's cancelled, going and watching the opera, that's cancelled, going to church and shaking hands with everybody and telling them, how well you get on with the God theory because once upon a time years ago you had a spiritual experience 
and you think because you've had a spiritual experience and a lot of people haven't, therefore you've done something special and you've got a personal relationship with the creator of the universe and you can do whatever you want to do and it'll be ticked off in heaven. Happy clappy. Yeah, like my fucking Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, from the Hillsong Church of the Prosperity God. Yep. Yep. And today's news is that after the lockdown was announced, after Australia's border closure was announced, the cretins from the tourism, in inverted commas, air, commas, air quotes, industry, the industry that produces nothing, they let 1,700 people off a fucking cruise boat in Sydney Harbour. Was it Botany Bay? Botany Bay. Let them off there. As soon as they come off, half a dozen went to hospital and tested positive to the coronavirus because between the New South Wales Department of Health, the Australian Border Com Command Control Commission, whatever it is, the border farce, Peter Dutton's little bunch of agitated fascists running around trying to guard the nature of their reality with guns. The Sydney City Council, the Health Commission, between them all, they couldn't realise that you really can't close the borders because you're worried about a pandemic if you're going to release 1,700 people who've been on a boatload of fucking corona fomates or fomate generators. A fomate is a bit of virus floating in the environment. A fomate generator is anybody who's coughing out droplets that are infective. So yeah, one, one and a half thousand people who've been hanging around seven corona cases were let loose in Sydney yesterday. Why is it so? Well, it probably might have something to do with the fact that so many of the Liberal Party's donors are high ups in the tourism industry who don't like making waves. They want things to just squeeze through. They like, they like to call on friends in high places and get special permission to just duck around the regulations. Scott Morrison and Anita Berejiklian, they're going to fucking regret winning their last election because it means they're in charge while all this shit's going down and they haven't got a clue because they all studied economics and commerce and political history at school. None of them studied fucking science. None of them studied biology. None of them understand what's going on because they think that the absolute supreme most important thing is the economy. And as far as every other living thing on the planet is concerned, it's the economy that's the problem, stupid. 10,000 years ago, humanity and all the humanity's domestic animals made up 1.5% of the land vertebrate animal biomass. We're not going to count the insects. Just everything on land with a backbone. Not going to count the whales in the ocean. Today, Humanity and humanity's pets and domestic livestock makes up 98.5% of the land animal vertebrate biomass. You wonder why the fucking bats and the viruses have ganged up on us? We have been out of control for 12 and a half thousand years. We have demonstrated our supreme unwillingness to do anything to control ourselves, so we are being controlled. You want to stick around and watch the finale? Stick around and watch the finale. Wash your hands. Maintain your social distance. Stay two metres away from everybody else. So you've got a metre and they've got a metre. Don't go up and, you know, get in within three feet of them because you're breaking both your quarantine. It's what we're in. We're in quarantine. Personal, individual, self-enforced quarantine. When you come down with the disease, that's when you go into isolation. And here's, here's a point. I heard somebody suggest it on radio. My daughter says I should write for the bloody local member of parliament. And yeah, maybe I'll dig out the typewriter. As soon as people are tested positive for coronavirus, at the moment, we have a large number of empty motels. The motels are full of single and double rooms, which have a TV, a computer connection, a toilet, a shower, a microwave, a jug, 
and a sink for washing their hands. Our hospitals are going to be overflowing rather than telling people to nurse themselves at home and hope that they stay isolated. Why doesn't the government commandeer all the motels? Not the hotels, the big complex buildings, the motels which in Australia are all sort of built open plan on the ground. So you've you've got a driveway of bitumen to walk and your individual doors to individual rooms. It's going to be so much easier to bury a nurse, everybody who needs to be isolated, kept under lock and key and fed through the porthole in the, in the motel door, uh, room for two weeks, maybe three weeks, until they stop shedding virus and can be safely released into the community. Maybe one of the other countries on the planet is already doing it, and I heard it reported, but somebody said it on the radio, and I think that's a really fucking clever idea. Really clever one. To everybody who says, oh, it's no worse than the flu. Yeah, well, um, I had one fella on my channel said, let's have a little game, you know. He said, we'll wait until December and we'll see that it's no worse than the flu. And I said, yeah, well, game on, game over. You lost because Italy. They're now running a death rate of 8.5%, not 6.8%, not 3.4%. Certainly not the one or two percent that China had. I think in Taiwan, somewhere over there, they they just isolated everybody. I don't know whether they tested everybody, but they isolated everybody around one little concentrated um, outbreak. And just by isolating everybody, they they got their death rate down to 0.4 of a percent, only four times worse than the flu. But all the dem democratic countries that are big on freedom, who don't want the government to tell them what to do, who haven't got any savings and who haven't got any stock of spare food, you know, who have to go shopping every two days, every three days, yeah, they're kind of going to be up the shit. That's where we're at at the moment. How long have you been prepping? Ever since I could see that it was a necessary thing to do. Back in about 1983, by accident or design, a Korean Airlines jumbo jet, flight number KAL007, licensed to kill, right? As I said, the creator of my universe has a wicked sense of humour. KAL007, the Korean jumbo jet with a licence to kill, somehow miraculously strayed off course to starboard while it was flying from Alaska to South Korea. Its off course deviation meant that it overflew the Kamchatka Peninsula, which was where the United Soviet Socialist Republics used to conduct a whole lot of their rocket research. And the USSR didn't take kindly to it, and they shot the fucking thing down. Bap, 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 bang. Crash, burn, die syndrome. Jumbo jet full of people. I had a girlfriend at the time, and we both had organised four days off. Now, whether we'd organised the four days off prior to that, or whether we did it at short notice, kind of escapes the fogs of my memory. But I do recall that we... 80 miles out of Sydney, we went down to Vargo and stayed at a really old, uncomfortable, lumpy mattress type roadhouse, an oldie fashioned -y roadhouse, which was actually a, a pub that offered accommodation. Because at the time there was a US Navy vessel in Sydney Harbour and we figured that there was obviously a Soviet hunter killer sub outside the harbour and if if it all turned to turds, we wanted to be watching the fireball from 80 miles away rather than sitting under it in Sydney, where we were both student nurses. And when you consider the suddenness with which a global thermonuclear war could have erupted, and it still could at any time, you know, like somebody may decide that they they want to stop the flood of potentially corona-infected refugees across their borders by nuking 
the ocean or the mountains where the refugees are coming from. It could still happen. Compared to that, this is the slowest, gentlest, almost most loving entrance to an apocalypse that I could possibly have imagined. Most of your viral pandemic scenarios involve something which spreads really fast, you know, has a reproductive number of six or eight, and people start to die as their first symptom, you know, like they're contagious for a week, and then all of a sudden they get a headache, their eyes bleed, and then they start chewing on their neighbor's neck. We're not getting anything like that. And all of the people who think that the Extinction Rebellion were a bunch of irritating youngsters, brainwashed, usefully stupid patsies, all the people who think that it's obvious that the environment exists to be exploited for the benefit of the economy, that whole well, three generations, if you count the space cadets as well as the baby boomers as well as the silent generation, yeah, they're going to be thinned out. Whether they're going to be thinned out according to political belief, that kind of depends on their behaviour. And there again, we've got another good one. Not only is this disease killing 66 men for every 33 women, not only is 60% of the people who are dead over the age of 55, not only is nobody dead who's under nine and only one person dead who's under 19, but the people who are going to be most easily infected, cross-contaminated, is the people who are the strongest science denialists who take pride in sticking by their lifestyle. So if they grew up looking everybody in the eye and shaking hands, Regardless of the fact that there's a whole bunch of cultures where if you look somebody in the eye, it's a soul-to-soul -soul contact where you're either challenging them or inviting them to copulate. Now, you're trying to ignite the fight or fuck response by looking someone in the eye. It's only for intimate family members, people that you actually trust deeply, or somebody that you're prepared to go tooth to claw against. Not so in the European cultures. As far as they're concerned, anybody who won't meet your gaze is trying to hide something, which explains all kinds of toxic intercultural interactions. But somebody who always prides themselves on a firm handshake, grabbing somebody by the shoulder while shaking their hand and breathing in their face, yeah, they're going to die at a much higher rate because they're going to get infected at a much higher rate and they tend to be the old of the old men. You know, Rupert Murdoch, suck shit, mate. This one's coming for you. Politicians, people who make a living by pressing the flesh and kissing other people's babies. Yeah, guess what, ladies and gentles? You are entered for the handicap stakes. Your personality is your handicap. Generally, by the time you get to be a politician in a position of power and authority, you've got date of birth syndrome too. You're getting up there in the age. Someone like me, swamp wallabies aren't going to give me novel coronavirus. Kangaroos aren't going to give it to me. Possums aren't going to give it to me. Bowbirds, currawongs, magpies, chuffs, when they come for a visit, they're not going to give it to me. If somebody said they were going to shoot me if I come off my property for any time in the next six weeks, okay, I could stay here, but they'd have to assure me that somebody was going to look after me mother. Otherwise, well, I think you'd find I'd get past them because thou shalt honour thy father and thy mother. And if, if that means that you have to go and risk contracting the virus in order to look after your aged relative, 
Do you want to go on with life being the sort of asshole who left your parents to die? Really? I know a bloke who did that. He spent the rest of his life trying to stuff enough painkiller up his arm to forget what a low-grade arsehole he thought he was because he left his parents to die. It was an acute situation, you know, like he had a, a choice. Try to save other people or try to save himself. He saved himself. But he was never the same man afterwards. So, yeah, if them's your choices, we're looking at the end of the global vile age anyway. In three months or six months' time, who's going to have the resources to go on a holiday to restart the airline and tourism industry? Who's going to still have workers? to go back to work in the factory when the factory on the other side of the world that produces your component parts gets its raw materials. Once you, once you stop the fossil fuel industrial global trade-based civilization, it can grind to a halt in a matter of days if you blow up the nodes. It can close itself down in a matter of months. But once it's closed down, unless you've got the same access to cheap resources and cheap energy that you had when the whole system was initially bootstrapped from the ground up, if you haven't got cheap energy and cheap resources, it's never going to go again. If you shut a coal mine down and the pumps are stopped and the workings fill up with water, and then there's no coal to run the power station, to make the electricity, to run the pumps, to get back down the mine, then the coal mine is not a coal mine. It's a well. The railway line is not a railway line. It's, it's a fucking garden ornament. And the power station is a memory to the days when they used to have enough coal to burn in the furnaces, to boil the water, to make the steam, to blow on the windmill, to spin the wheel covered with magnets, to excite the electrons, to run all of the electronic funds transfer machines and the banking computers and the tap and go machines at every shop. Just saying. It took 12,000 years to build the economy to the point where it was at 300 years ago when we had the Industrial Revolution, the steam powered Industrial Revolution. On the bright side, look at that. From my daughter, yesterday, on the side of the road where she's doing her lollipop lady traffic control duty, she spotted enough tracky mean incisor, wild native parsnips, for to dig herself up a snack. And she sent the old man a photo. To which I replied, Yay team, I always told you that when the world fell to bits, you'd have to be able to know wild native parsnips. This is excellent. How did the rest of the crew take to your superior bushcraft? So, um, how long have I been prepping? when it all comes down to it. How long have I been prepping? At least 40 years, because I've still got a 40 year old out of date gas bottle. And as well as having taught my kids who are now 29 and 30, how to identify and harvest wild native food plants, the forest floor around here also features feral tomatoes.
coming up. All over the lawn. And those cashed up yuppies at Bilo seven weeks ago wanted me to tell them how long I've been prepping. Forty years or more, sonny. Forty years or more. Therefore, thus and because, guess who has a ringside seat? As the global vile age slowly and gently disappears up its own cloaca. Warbles on a lot to YouTube. Ciao.